Well, good morning to those of you who are here on this uh, holiday in the UP, uh, November 15th. Um, thanks for coming out today. It's good to be together in this place. And to those of you who are watching online, whether you're in Delta County or in one of a number of states, we keep getting messages and emails from people in other states who are following our worship at Grace. And it's um, joy to us and privilege to have you with us today in this place. Well, if you have a Bible with you, you could turn right now uh, with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark 7, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 24 to 30. And we are in a, a series that we're calling Jesus Up Close, seeing Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And so we're going through this uh, gospel that was really the eyewitness account of Peter as reported to a first century follower of Jesus named John Mark, who's kind of like a secretary to Peter. And, and what Mark records are the reflections of Peter on time that he had with Jesus, things that he saw, things that he heard, things that he experienced as he interacted with Jesus. And today, in this message in the series, it's Jesus up close, humility, healthy brokenness, and great faith. Now, before we read this passage, I want to review for a moment with you a principle that's a very valuable, strategic principle in the kingdom of God. And frankly, it's a very counterintuitive principle for us. It's a principle that's evident in the lives of people whose lives display joy and fruitful impact and influence for Jesus. It's the principle of healthy inward brokenness. And I want to start here this morning because what I want to submit to you is it'll be very difficult to understand what's going on in the conversation that we observed this morning between Jesus and a Syrophoenician woman. Because I believe that this woman evidenced, displayed this healthy inward brokenness. John Newton uh, wrote the familiar hymn that many of us are aware of, Amazing Grace. John Newton's life was radically transformed by Jesus. He went from a hardened slave trader to a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And one of Newton's uh, most famous quotes goes like this, it's on the screen. Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. And what I want to, uh, what I want to assert this morning is that a statement like that is a statement that issues forth out of a life where there is a healthy sense of inward brokenness. Newton's joy was fueled and solidified by this truth. In fact, what we need to see is his joy was not hindered by this truth. He was known to be, after he came to Christ, a joyful man. Brokenness. Inward brokenness. King David used that term in Psalm 51. In that great song that he wrote, a song of repentance. And he comes to the end of that song and he says, God, you don't desire burnt offering or sacrifice or I would bring it. You're not so interested in those external kind of sacrifices. But rather, God, you desire a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
And that theme of brokenness is peppered through the scripture in a number of places. For example, God says through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 57, 15, I live in a high and holy place and also with the one who is lowly and contrite. To revive the heart of the lowly. To revive the soul of the contrite. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, spent some time talking about those who were blessed, possessing and enduring happiness. What he says is their hearts are characterized by this disposition. He begins the Beatitudes by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. How counterintuitive is that? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In other words, now watch this, friends. In other words, there is blessing in brokenness. It's very counterintuitive. And when we speak of brokenness, we're not primarily, we're not primarily talking about the specifics of outward circumstances. We're talking about an inward disposition of the soul. Because I think we all get this, right? It's possible to go through a shattering outward circumstance, a shattering experience outwardly, and not be broken inwardly at all. In fact, there are people who go through difficult circumstances who become hardened inwardly. We're talking this morning, when we talk about this theme of biblical brokenness, an inward disposition of the soul. And in the passage that we're looking at in Mark 7, we're going to see as we observe a conversation between Jesus and a needy woman that the dynamic of inward brokenness is linked or connected to the quality of faith that issues forth from your life. So let's look at this passage together now, beginning at verse 24 of Mark 7. It's going to be on the screen. If you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to follow along there. Or, or if you have a Bible app on your phone, go there, just turn the ringer down, but follow along. Verse 24, and from there, he, Jesus, arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and didn't want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. She was a mom in crisis. She had a daughter who was suffering, and she was desperate on the behalf of her daughter. I'd like to introduce you to this woman by revealing her name, but I don't know her name. Interestingly, in this story, she's never mentioned by name. In the parallel in Matthew 15, she's never mentioned by name. In fact, I don't know a lot about her other than this, that she loved her daughter and she evidently believed. She believed that Jesus had authority and power 
to help her little girl. Now this incident culminates with a beautiful ending, yet there are aspects of this story that are surprising. Can we say it? Even unnerving. A bit even disconcerting. On the surface, Jesus' preliminary response to this needy mom in the story is frankly a little perplexing, isn't it? Knocks us off balance a little bit. And maybe, maybe it's that having been knocked off balance, it's that tension in the story that's going to be really helpful in helping us to understand what's going on here. Lord, what are you trying to say to us through this passage? As this episode hits its crescendo, Jesus commends the woman's faith. In the Gospels, there are only two times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are only two times when Jesus very openly remarks with commendation about someone's faith. In Matthew chapter 8, there was a Roman centurion, by the way, not a Jew, a Roman centurion who uh, came appealing to Jesus, and through that conversation, Jesus said to him, you've got significant faith. And then there's this Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7. In fact, in the parallel account of this passage, Mark 7, 24 to 30, that's recorded for us in Matthew 15, 21 to 28, Jesus says this to this woman, O woman, great is your faith. Now, I don't mind telling you, when I see a statement like that from the lips of Jesus to someone, this arouses my curiosity. It just does. I want to know what's going on here. I love and trust and follow Jesus Christ. And consequently, my attention is riveted to this interchange between Jesus and this Syrophoenician woman. What was it about her that prompted Jesus to say that her faith was great? I want to pay attention to this. And perhaps the Holy Spirit right now is arousing a similar desire in you. I hope he is. So let's begin to unpack this passage. Let's get some background. We learn in verse 24 that Jesus has withdrawn from Galilee. That's where he was spending a significant amount of time teaching, healing, interacting with people. He lived in a coastal city on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. But now he's left that area and he's gone to a, uh, a region with cities Tyre and Sidon that was primarily populated by Gentile people. And while he's in this region of Tyre and Sidon, a woman who's a Gentile, a Syrophoenician woman, comes looking for him. Now, one of the things that I hope we know from the gospel and from reading through the scripture is that more than our ethnicity or tradition or even religious background, God is concerned about our hearts. That was true in the first century, it's true today. God's not impressed by outward appearance. We saw last week that Jesus reminded some religious leaders, the religious elite of the day, of what God had said through the prophet Isaiah, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's a pretty provocative statement. Jesus was saying to them, you may live in a world where image is everything, but in the kingdom of God, image management is frankly irrelevant. It's irrelevant. And here's why. Because God is always looking, friends, at our hearts. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at your heart. Our heart is that place where our will resides, from where we make choices. Our heart is that place where affections 
are shaped. What do we love? What do we prefer? It's that place where priorities are seated in our lives. It's our heart. God is always looking at our heart. And sometimes Jesus does his most amazing work in unexpected places. And in the lives of people in whom we would not have anticipated him to work so powerfully and so profoundly. We're told in verse 24 that Jesus goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The city of Tyre was in the overlapping regions of Phoenicia and Syria along the Mediterranean coast. It was an area, and this is significant, it was an area that was actually outside of Israel. Mark refers to this woman as Gentile, Syrophoenician. In Matthew's parallel gospel account in Matthew 15, she's referred to as a Canaanite woman. She's not a Jew, but she certainly heard of Jesus. And the fame of Jesus is spreading beyond borders. At this point in his public ministry, his presence doesn't stay secret for very long. And this mom hears that Jesus is in the area on the behalf of her little girl. She's resolved to find him. We're told that this daughter had a desperate need. She was afflicted with an evil spirit. She had been demonized. And that brings us to verses 25 to 26, where we read this. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, Jesus, and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So we get the picture, right? This is a desperate mom. She's coming on the behalf of her little girl. And initially, the response of Jesus is, well, startling. Jesus doesn't send her away. He's very deliberate in all of this. But then he says something that must have knocked her off balance. The first time I read this, it knocked me off balance. In verse 27, Jesus says, Let the little children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, what's going on here? I mean, what in the world is going on here? This is perplexing. <clears throat> it's not the kind of response we would have, would have expected from Jesus. If you had been this Gentile Syrophoenician, non-Jewish woman, how might that have sounded to you? Jesus wasn't being capricious here, and I don't believe he was being thoughtlessly insensitive. Here's what I believe is happening in this conversation. Now watch this, friends. This is key. Jesus is testing her. He already sees that there is in her the seed of faith. She's come looking to him. At some level, she believes that he is who she has heard that he is and that he has power to do something on the behalf of her little girl. So there is some seed of faith there. And I think Jesus, who sees that authentic faith that prompted her to come to him in the first place, is drawing faith out right now by testing her faith. Tests are not always pleasant for the ones being tested, isn't that true? Perhaps some of you have heard the story about uh, a guy, a college student in an ornithology class, the study of birds. And the teacher had a reputation for being really demanding, so the guy studies incredibly hard for the final. He goes to class feeling ready, but he wasn't prepared for what he discovered when he got to class. This guy had studied for hours. He'd studied hard. Instead of having a normal test, there was on the front wall of the classroom 25 sets of birds' feet. And the class was to, uh, the test was that they were to identify 
the bird whose feet these were. And the student says to the teacher, sir, I don't want to take this test because I didn't prepare to name birds by recognizing their feet. And the teacher says, well, you have to take the test or you're going to fail. And the kid says, okay, then I guess I'm going to fail. The teacher says, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me your name. The kid rolls up his pants, exposing his feet, and he says, you tell me. <laughs> you tell me what my name is. Some tests are more challenging than others. And this mom in Mark 7, 24 to 30, is being tested. Her resolve is being challenged. And her response to this testing, friends, I just got to tell you, this woman, this woman and her faith have impacted my life for the last 17 years. I first taught from this story in January of 2004. I was doing an original five-week series as a guest speaker at a church in Hudson, Wisconsin. And the series was Blessings Out of Brokenness. And this was one of those messages. And for the last 17 years, this woman's faith has provoked something in me and challenged something in me. She never lost her resolve. She believed Jesus and his power to save. In the parallel passage in Matthew 15, 21 to 28, three times in the passage, she refers to Jesus as Lord. She calls him Lord in verse 22, verse 25, and verse 27 of Matthew 15. And then she refers to him as the son of David in verse 22. A designation that was that specifically referred to Israel's Messiah, the promised one who would come. Here's the point. She knew who he is. She was aware of who he is. And she had heard he has power to save, power to heal. By faith, she intends to get in front of him and lay before him her need. And she just keeps coming. She's tested and she just keeps coming. She's kind of like Dorian finding Nemo. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. She just perseveres and keeps coming after Jesus. And Jesus tested her by using a cultural image that was familiar in the first century. Jesus replies in verse 27, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to their dogs. Ugh, why did Jesus say that? What we don't hear is the tone of his voice, and what we don't realize is that Jesus was utilizing a cultural image that circulated in the first century that not only people in Israel, but people outside Israel were familiar with. In that culture, at that time in the first century, the people of Israel were viewed as heirs of the promise and they were regarded to be like children. While Gentiles, who are not yet heirs of the promise, according to this cultural image, were figuratively a bit like the beloved pet dogs in a family sharing a home with the children. The little dogs might share the home, but they would not share in all the privileges that the children enjoyed. Friends, I just believe Jesus is drawing her out here. He loved her. Jesus soberly said, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. How's this mom going to respond? Is she going to bail and give up her pursuit? 
Will she try to leverage influence with some manipulative tactic? How is she going to respond to Jesus? Look at verse 28 of Mark 7. This is what she says, this amazing woman humbling herself before an extraordinarily amazing Savior. Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. This is amazing. Her humility is stunning. And I think in the conversation, there was a long pause because, friends, I believe our Lord Jesus was deeply moved by her response. She had not only persevered through the test, she had displayed virtue and a quality of sincere faith that he had rarely seen. In Matthew's parallel account, we hear Jesus say in Matthew 15, 28, woman, woman, you have great faith. You have great faith. And at that point, on the spot, he exercised his supernatural authority and he delivered her daughter from her bondage to being demonized. Like that. Jesus set the girl free. He said to this Syrophoenician woman, for this statement, this humble statement of faith, Issuing out of a heart with a healthy measure of inward brokenness. For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Can you see it? Can you imagine it? Can you, can you imagine those words from Jesus coming to this woman? And this woman goes home and sees that her daughter is looking once again like the little girl she had raised from childhood. It's as though she has her little girl back again. This was a mom whose great faith resulted in great blessing on the behalf of her daughter. So what are the takeaways for us from this story? I mean, what can we take with us out of this story? There are at least a couple of valuable truths in this incident. First of all, Jesus is willing to test the quality of your faith for his glory and for your good. I am personally absolutely convinced, persuaded, that Jesus' heart went out to this mom and he felt compassion for her from the first moment that she approached him. And in, now watch this everyone, and in his love for her, he challenges, tests her faith. Jesus was a master teacher and he was one who masterfully utilized this teaching tool of testing. He used it with his disciples. In fact, one of his disciples wrote sometime later, this is the disciple Peter in 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer in grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Friends, I think we get this, right? We've tasted a bit of it, many of us, this year. Jesus may occasionally back his disciples That term disciple in the Greek is methetes, learner, apprentice. Jesus may back his disciples, his learners, into a corner in order to test their faith. 
We've already seen it in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion to feed a crowd when they didn't have enough food or resources. He puts them in a boat one day when a serious storm is coming up over the Sea of Galilee. And he sends them out. He sent them out knowing the storm was coming. In all of these instances, he was testing their faith, now watch this, and positioning them to see fresh expressions of his power and his glory on display. 2020, I mean, uh, come on. It's been, it's been a really challenging year. The other night, our elders were meeting and we came to the end of our meeting and I was so heartened by something that my brother Scott Randall shared. He said, this has been a really hard year. He said, you know, my faith is most stretched. Not when, not when everything is in place and exceedingly good, but when there are some things that are awry and I have opportunity in the midst of the conflict to see God moving in the midst of it. I love that. So ministered to me that night. Mark it well, friends. Jesus is willing to test the quality of your faith. He'll do it for his glory. And now watch this. And he's doing it for your good, for your greater joy. Which brings us to a second and final principle that stands out in this passage. The quality of your faith is related in some measure to the degree of your inward brokenness. The term brokenness doesn't appear in this story, but this woman is demonstrating it all over the place. There is here an inward posture of brokenness that's demonstrated in the way she responds to Jesus and what I long for myself and for you, for us, this weekend is that we would see that there really is some kind of connection, link between an inward disposition of healthy brokenness and the quality of the faith that we exercise. I so want us to see that. As we said earlier, someone could go through a crushing outward experience and still not be truly broken inwardly. In fact, they might become hardened. Inward brokenness relates to seeing God rightly as he is, as high and holy and glorious, and seeing ourselves rightly and honestly in light of who God is. And I hope as we see ourselves rightly, we would realize that this amazing, awesome God that we've come to worship has loved us in Jesus Christ. So, there's really not a place, friends, really, in healthy Christian community for us to be pompous or presumptuous. The call is to be broken inwardly broken. And this will affect the quality of the kind of faith that we live out here at Grace Church. Brokenness is what stands out to me about this woman. She's needy. She comes to Jesus with her need. She stays. She remains laser focused on him. She's not presumptuous, never presuming that she's somehow deserving of his blessing. What she humbly does is ask for mercy on the behalf of her little girl, a daughter she loves, and a great savior called out of her this great faith. And he was delighted to grant her the blessing that she'd come seeking. She's not trying to prove herself. She's not seeking any particular commendation. She doesn't come to Jesus heralding her accomplishments. Here's why you should bless me. Instead, she comes honestly admitting her need. 
That's how she comes. We sang earlier today, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. That's the way broken people who are healthy and joyful come to Jesus. I need you. Because you see, the quality of faith you display and live out before Jesus is related to the measure of your inward brokenness. Friends, honestly, I am sorry I can't refer to the mom in this story by name. She's had an impact on my life over many years now. She's only referred to as a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician woman. We're not given a name for this woman of great faith. And perhaps that tells us something. You see, she had no interest in making a name for herself. She didn't have time for that. She was singularly focused on pursuing Jesus and seeking his transformational power on the behalf of her family. Friends, this is what great faith looks like. Father in heaven, God, I pray you do what only you can do. God, I pray that you would speak to brothers and sisters in this place, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would assure us. And Father, for people who came into this room today who are just curious about Jesus, not really sure where they stand with him, God, I pray that you'd open their eyes wide to what a great Savior he is. And how he's aiming to call out of us a faith, authentic trust, healthy brokenness. Lord, I pray that uh, as your spirit works in us, you would persuade us that great faith is the pathway to great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.